So I started my research uh, the past summer in like early June and I've been continuing to do it uh, up till now. It's been almost seven and a half months. So what I realized is that research is like, it's not like a nerd working in like a lab, like not communicating with anyone. I had to reach out to so many different people uh, in order to accomplish my goals. A lot of hard work goes on there. I mean, there are a lot of pitfalls and I certainly had my like I had so many obstacles in my way. I had to like tackle them one by one, and if I'd given up in any step along the way, I wouldn't be where I am right now. I wouldn't be able to like achieve any like conclusion or anything. So, yeah, my major takeaways were: um, it's a collaborative field, no matter what field uh, in the academics you enter, and uh, hard work and innovation is are definitely needed. So uh, I first got into research in ninth grade with my twin sister because we have a grandfather with Parkinson's disease, so we're really interested in studying that. So we basically just did an independent project uh, behind Mr. Lee's room uh, in like at Lindbrook and stuff with no like external lab or anything, and we really found the experience really like a fun thing. And even though it was pretty hard because it was like independent, we really like loved the thrill of discovery. So um, that kind of really sparked my interest in science. And in tenth grade, my sister and I we did another project together uh, on Parkinson's disease, and then the summer between tenth and eleventh, we did like a research internship at this place called the Parkinson's Institute, which is like a center completely devoted to Parkinson's research. So we had done like a lot of stuff on Parkinson's on, and specifically on finding like new drugs for Parkinson's. So um, at that point I was really interested in how these drugs are taken from like just experiments in the lab to actually being used in, in patients. You should really choose like do research that you're really excited about because because I was like fascinated by the topics that I was studying, I felt like that's why I, was, I, I like spent a lot of time without thinking that's like work or like something that's like kind of boring. So basically, um, I definitely like research because it allows you to go and explore new technologies. And just like if you're really passionate about STEM, it's a really good way to get involved before you go into um, college because you want to like, try to find what fields interest you. And in high school, it's like a really good time to explore these different fields. So I started off in high school really enjoying like robotics. And I knew from a general perspective that I wanted to do engineering. But then in my uh, sec in 10th grade summer, I went to a summer program where basically um, they let me build whatever I wanted for as long as I told them the price range was under $2,000. So one thing that was really interesting to me was like um, building a robotic hand for people who don't, like a prosthetic basically, for people who don't have hands. And that's when I discovered the field of biomechanics, which is basically combining robotics in the field of biology to enhance like an augment human um, behaviors. One the thing that I recommend is like, Bring, try to bring your passions into something related to what you can do for your research and definitely reach out to people. Um, I, de I reached out to a bunch of doctors try to get their, their analysis and their um, recommendations for the project so that definitely helped as well. And you shouldn't be afraid if you don't get into a research lab as well because I did this entire project at home. So you don't need to have a research lab in order to do what you're most passionate about. So, in astronomy, there are many fields, and uh, my, my specific research revolves around galaxy evolution. Like how does a galaxy turn from like a massive gas and evolve into all the stars, and nebula, etc., inside a galaxy? And one thing that has always puzzled astronomers is how does like how do the spirals form in a galaxy? For example, like the spirals of the Milky Way. And uh, one way to study that is to study um, different galaxies from like, uh, different redshifts, which is essentially distances from us and how far they're moving away from us. So recently, um, in the past uh, few decades, uh, my mentor, Professor Gua of the University of Florida, has discovered a new type of uh, a host galaxy um, called uh, 2175 Ingstrom Dust Absorber Host Galaxies. And uh, they're very similar, in a sense, they're very similar to the Milky Way. And by studying these galaxies, I'm able to infer properties about the Milky Way. Um, yeah, so the technical thing is um, in an image, in a data image just taken, we have a very bright object called a quasar that, that like, basically lights up the, uh, gal the nearby galaxy. And uh, in order to study, however, this data is taken by ground-based telescopes whose image resolution is really poor and the galaxies are frequently too faint to be seen. So in order to, um, in order to um, analyze the statistical properties of such galaxies, uh, we implement a stacking technique in order so that we s systematically stack like hundreds or thousands of such images in order to systematically decrease the noise uh, in the images, in the overall image, and boost up the signal to noise ratio so that we can detect the uh, galaxies. So um, before I explain what I did in my project, I think it's important to first talk about how we take drugs today. 
So today when you have like a chronic disease anywhere in your body, whether you have like Alzheimer's disease or cancer, drugs are generally administered with, by two methods. They're either administered through pills and tablets through your mouth, or they're injected intravenously. So the problem with drug administration by these methods is that the blood then enters the bloodstream and it's distributed all around the body, no matter where the site of disease is. So even if you, for example, have pain in your hip, you'll still take a drug that's distributed all around the body and not just targeted to where your hip is. So the problem with this is that, first of all, it causes lots of side effects because the drug goes to areas of the body where it's not needed. And second of all, there's very low drug efficacy as only a small percentage of the drug they administer actually reaches the site of disease where it's needed. So for this, these reasons, scientists are developing, uh, a lot of scientists are trying to develop new nanotechnology based drug delivery systems that can deliver drugs in more targeted methods so that you can avoid side effects and have higher drug efficacy. So in my product, what I basically developed was one of these type of nanotechnology based drug delivery systems and specifically I developed a nanofilm that's um, basically less than one micrometer thick and uh, it's made of a smart polymer that's loaded with these drug molecules which are represented by these uh, green dots. And basically, the way that this works is that when you apply an electric stimulus, then the smart polymer breaks down, allowing the drug to be released outside the film. And when you don't apply an electric stimulus, then no drug gets released. So in the future, um, what I think I, this could be used for in real life application is that physicians could take the nanofilm loaded with the drug of choice and implant it at, right at the site of disease. So the cool thing about this is that you can directly target drug delivery to where the disease is, and by using electric stimulus, you can determine the timing of the drug release and control the dosage very precisely by varying the strength of electric stimulus. So the really cool thing about this is that, first of all, it lowers uh, side effects because the drug is targeted directly to the site of disease where it's needed. And the second uh, really cool thing is that it enhances drug efficacy because you have the drug right there and no drug is lost to like other areas of the body. And an additional cool thing about nanotechnology based drug delivery systems like this is that you can have really personalized drug regimens because since you have control over when the drug is released by only applying an electric stimulus and how much of the drug is released by making like a stronger electric stimulus versus a weaker one, you can really personalize drug delivery based on the patient's needs. So for example, if someone has pain in their hip, then you can release drug more when they're having more pain and less when they're having less pain. So that's why you can really personalize drug regimens much better with this product. So my project revolves around bronchoscopies. Bronchoscopies are basically tools that allow doctors to view and diagnose diseases in the lungs, and they're the only tool that provide this functionality to doctors. So there are two main types of bronchoscopies. One is basically where they stick a straight rod down your mouth and into the lungs to see it. But the more common one is a flexible bronchoscope, which is entered either through the nose or the mouth, and is just gently pushed down into your lungs. Of course, it's anesthesia and all that. But the main problem is navigating um, this tool. Because as, as the only tool that can diagnose lung cancer, pneumonia, or even to the common cold, all these different things require the bronchoscopy tool. So currently, as when doctors try to navigate, they basically use a radiation bed, and then while they're doing this, they're trying to see, the radiation bed allows them to see where the tool is at any given moment in a black and white 2D map. However, this is not very accurate, especially for the lungs, which are a 3D object, and it, it's more like a maze in 3D, basically. When the doctors need to push the t uh, bronchoscope into various corners of the lungs, this can apply pressure to the various bronchioles, like the air passages, and this can affect and damage these passages. So ha providing doctors with correct information and a better 3D map would definitely help them diagnose diseases better and be able to navigate the lungs at a better rate. So what I developed was a, t a new way for doctors to do this. So I wanted to make sure that the technology that I provided to doctors could be used right away with a lot of with less um, uh, additions to the technology because I want it to be adaptable to any scenario. So one thing that I noticed was the doctors have a video feed at the very tip of the tool, which is like a small camera. So what you could be done was that as the tool was pushed further for and further down the lungs, you can use this video feed to convert into a 3D model of the lung. So as the in real time, so as the tool is being pushed further down, you're going to be generating a 3D model of the lung three centimeters ahead of where the tool is. So this will allow the doctor to see what they will be moving into, as well as our implemented features of um, abnormality detection. So if there's a possible mass of like lung cancer, like tissue or um, a possible wound, the doctor will be able to de detect diseases that they might not have seen in the first place. And this is extremely important when considering how big these um, bronchioles are, because when you reach the end tips, um, these are where 
um, tumors and other forms of disease can happen uh, or, or where they originate. So having a tool that can navigate further and deeper into the lungs can definitely help doctors diagnose and prevent diseases before they, uh, before they progress and damage.